Okay, so um, I'm now talking about another part of the body, but I think Dr. Collar's talk was great because she actually mentioned some of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about. And um, um, I am a big fan of estrogen, I am, but uh, we won't be talking about that particular hormone in this um, particular uh, 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 session. But so I'm here to bring up the rear, as they say. <laughs> Um, as the uh, final speaker of the evening. And uh, we all know that there are differences between men and women. Um, I study sex differences with respect to the brain and how the brain functions. And uh, there are big differences in the central nervous system, okay? So there are definite differences, and it's not, it's not anti-PC to say that the male brain is different than the female brain. That's okay. We've all, we've all said that, and it's, and it's a, actually the National Institute of Health is now criticizing. I sit on review committees for the government, and we actually criticize grants that come to us if they don't look at sex differences, if they don't really try and say, okay, well, what? Because sex differences exist not only for mental health and behavioral health issues, but so many medical issues that are out there. And so it's a really fascinating area of work. Now, the one thing you probably know is that hormones are certainly different um, in men and women. Um, this is sort of an example of what happens at puberty. Your estradiol and progesterone levels are going up and down um, with your menstrual periods. And then you get pregnant, and your brain is actually bathed in these really high levels of hormones. Well, then you deliver the baby, and you deliver the placenta. And guess what? Within 48 hours, you're basically a postmenopausal woman as far as your hormone levels are concerned. I mean, it is boom, 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 like that. That placenta is gone. And those hormones that were sitting there bathing your body and brain are gone. The thing that I want you to really appreciate is that hormones have an incredibly powerful effect on human behavior, okay? They're meant to help us reproduce, okay? Because if you think about what all species are doing on this planet, is maybe it's reproducing. I mean, that's how we keep going as a species, is that we reproduce. And so the hormones that you think of as just controlling your periods and stuff like that and giving you breast development and what have you, they actually control a lot of your behavior as well and many aspects of your behavior. And so um, I, when you, if you're like me and you're interested in the effects of hormones on the brain, it's much more interesting to study women when they've got all these ups and downs and what have you versus studying men because this is what happens in the men. You know, at puberty, the hormone levels go up and they stay up and they don't do anything interesting the rest of the male life. You know, it's just not that interesting to study, so I don't study them. Okay, so we've talked about sex differences. But actually, there are some hormones that are actually going on in your body that are very similar to how the male counterpart. So I am actually going to talk a little bit about the stress system because the, the female stress system is slightly different than the males, but the, what, the part that I'm going to talk about is actually very similar between males and females. Uh, basically, just to give you a little primer, uh, the hypothalamus, which was something, a part of the brain that Dr. Cowra was also talking about, which is in the brain, the pituitary, those actually um, secrete hormones that then get into the bloodstream and they travel to what we call the adrenal glands, which sit, these tiny little glands that sit right above your, um, near your kidneys. And that causes um, you to secrete the stress hormone cortisol, okay? So how many of you have ever heard of cortisol um, other than just here? So it's the stress hormone, okay? So that's normal. That's a normal thing that you want to have happen. If, um, if you're having some stress, you want to have this um, particular response. And then that cortisol, once it gets secreted, it feeds back onto the brain to say, okay, we've had a stress response, enough now, turn off the trigger, Okay, we don't need the stress response anymore. So it's, again, this very elegant song and dance between the brain and these um, organs and the rest of the body. So uh, that's another actual very important thing to remember. It's not only that hormones have such an important effect on behavior, but there's this really wonderful song and dance that goes on between the brain and other organs in the body through these hormones, okay? Now, the thing that I want to emphasize is that there are parts of the brain, and you don't have to remember what they're called, but these are parts of the brain that are important for things like memory and learning and regulation of your mood and your libido. So we're going to talk about all of those things. And so this stress response, the cortisol, not only feeds back on the parts of the brain that say turn off the stress response, it also 
hits other areas of the brain. It's not like cortisol just kind of creeps into the brain and goes to the hypothalamus and says, okay, you can shut off your hormone or the pituitary. It actually, the whole brain gets exposed to cortisol, and there are other areas of the brain that are important for behavior. They get affected by these um, stress hormones. So hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are two of those areas. So basically, you're walking down the street and you see a lion, uh, or you see your daughter's you know, first boyfriend. <laughs> and you go, oh my God. <laughs> you have a stress response. You're frightened. You should have a stress response. That's the normal thing to do. You want to secrete cortisol because basically that's your body's way of saying oh, this is a fight or flight response. If you see a lion, you're probably going to run, right? That's an important thing to know um, as a human is that that's probably not a safe place. So you feed back this cortisol on the brain. But what about, for example, all these things like chronic daily stressors? I mean, how many people feel that their life has gotten more stressful in the past 10 years? Okay, I mean, when is it going to stop? I mean, it just can't keep increasing and increasing and increasing. But these daily stressors, what happens is that then you're getting all this cortisol hitting the brain and affecting these brain regions. And after a while, it actually starts to not help the central nervous system. It actually starts to hurt those areas of the brain that are important for learning and memory, for example. So there's some people who study dementia, for example, um, people, geriatrician, um, geriatric psychiatrists, and people that are very interested in brain aging. And they actually have concern that one of the things that we might be seeing about dementia is that it's really a, a, a response to stress over life. And that, of course, we're all stressed, and not everybody becomes, has dementia when they're in their 70s and 80s, but a large percentage of people do. And actually, women seem to be more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than men, okay? So again, we're kind of starting to see the brain can only handle but so much of this stress, okay? So I'm not going to sit up here as a psychiatrist and tell you that I have the magic wand <laughs> for getting rid of stress in your life. Because I don't. I can't even get rid of the stress in my own life. I'm not going to be able to get rid of the stress in your life. It's just not what I can do, OK? So one of the things I can do is to help you become sensitive to the adverse effects of stress. And I'm going to talk to you about some things that I think, and the data and the research shows, um, are really helpful in fighting against the negative effects of stress. So one of those things is another hormone. I mean, a lot of you can remember when Demi Moore did this uh, I had for Vanity Fair, but um, basically oxytocin, how many people have heard of that hormone, okay? So a lot of you probably thought that it was important for milk letdown and uterine contraction during labor. So again, you were taught the reproductive reasons that oxytocin is important. Well, interestingly enough, oxytocin has very powerful effects on the brain and very power powerful effects for something called the initiation of maternal behavior. So basically, if you deprive animals, if you study, we can't do this in humans, obviously, because it wouldn't be ethical. But if you do this in other species, you deprive the female of oxytocin at the time of delivery, she will not perform maternal behavior with the offspring. Bottom line, she needs that oxytocin in order to initiate maternal behavior. Okay, So it's a very important hormone. It's called the cuddle hormone. It's, it's a hormone that's important for that bonding behavior between mothers and their offspring, okay? It's also the love-making hormone, okay? When you have orgasms, you actually secrete oxytocin. Um, it's a bonding between mother and child, a father and child, but it also helps to bond between couples um, to have oxytocin. So it's a very important hormone for that reason as well. Um, it's also an important hormone for when you get together with your friends and you kind of developed your female relationships. Um, you feel good afterwards. When you go out and you do something together with your friends, don't you feel rejuvenated and a little bit better? It helps to decrease the stress. Oxytocin is released when you get stressed out. It's almost like the body is saying, I know you're stressed, but let me give you a little bit of something to help you fight against the adverse effects of those stress. However, it gets more released when you do all these other things. So good sex, whether with yourself or with somebody else, <laughs> having orgasms are good. Being out with your girlfriends are good. 
being with people that you love, connecting, hugging people. There's even data showing that people who hug more have higher levels of oxytocin, couples that are more touchy-feely. So again, these are um, things that you can do to help decrease the effects of stress. So what else helps to fight stress and promote well-being? Okay, I'm going to talk about the dreaded exercise. But I'm not going to get up here and just talk to you about exercise as, you know, you should do it. I'm going to explain why it's good for your brain. But first of all, this old guy, Plato. This is, I think this is one of the most beautiful and well-written pieces. It's so true. He says, the lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being. Okay? You can't make it any more plain than that, okay? While the methodical movement, or me, uh, while movement and methodical physical exercise preserve it. I mean, it, this was something they said, I mean, how many years ago? I mean, this is not just something your grandmother told you was good for you. Plato is telling you that it's good for you. Well, what does Joan Rivers say? She goes, I don't exercise. If God wanted me to bend over, he would have put diamonds on the floor. And Ellen DeGeneres says, I don't really need buns of steel. Buns of cinnamon would be just fine. <laughs> so clearly people sort of make fun of this concept of exercise because it is tough. I mean, and people don't really like to do it a whole lot. However, when you do it, don't you feel better, typically? Not just because you did something you knew that was good for you. You actually feel better because you secrete different chemicals, brain chemicals, at when you exercise. So you get a sense of euphoria. You get a little shot of euphoria. You also are improving your, your aging. Your brain is going to age better if you exercise and you have less risk of Alzheimer's disease if you exercise, okay? I told you that stress increases cortisol. It reduces something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Don't even worry about thinking about that. I'm just going to say BDNF. And BDNF is like brain fertilizer, and I'll illustrate this in a minute. But your nerve cells in the brain are happier when you have BDNF. So if stress decreases BDNF, guess what? Extra, I mean, um, I was going to say estrogen because estrogen does increase it too, but exercise increases BDNF, okay? So you're basically getting more brain fertilizer. Those nerve cells are happier uh, when you exercise. Okay, and we know that lower levels of BDNF are associated with depression um, and that exercise, actually there have been studies that have shown that exercise has antidepressant effects. So do I think it's going to cure a major depressive episode? No. But lower levels of depression, exercise can be very helpful. So this is just a nerve cell, this green thing sitting over there. And you see all those little spots on the green thing? That's a happy neuron. Why is that a happy neuron? Because everywhere there's those little green spots, that is a potential area of communication between that lonely nerve cell and all the other nerve cells in the brain. And the one thing that you really want to have happen in your brain is you want to make connections between nerve cells because that is a healthy brain. We call that neuroplasticity. So without BDNF, that fertilizer, you don't get all those connections, okay? And so that's one of the reasons why those connections are so important. So when you think of, well, not when you just think about exercise, but when you do exercise, it is like you're taking some BDNF fertilizer, you're pouring it on the brain, and you're just sprouting those neurons, and they're just really happy, okay? So very, very important. BDNF brain fertilizer, okay? So what about sex? You know, it's the end of the evening. We have to talk about sex. Um, and, you know, uh, I know that some of you might thought, well, you know, this person's going to mention something about sex and aging. What about my libido? You know, I mean, you study the brain. I mean, the brain is certainly important for libido. Well, this is a colleague of mine from the University of Melbourne in Australia. And uh, Professor Lorraine Dennerstein did this lovely study where she took a whole host of women that were premenopausal and studied them yearly across the menopause transition. And she looked at things like, um, you know, mood, libido, sexual activity, um, just overall a lot of quality of life measures and just sense of well-being, um, a whole host of things. And she basically said, that there is one answer to libido during aging. And I'm not saying I'm a proponent of this, but this is what she found. Basically, 
she found that if you're with a guy who you weren't, you know, you've been with for a number of years and maybe things were not going as well and you weren't as interested in having sex, what she found is that the best boost to libido was a new partner. So, <laughs> so the women who had the best libido actually were with new people. Okay, so what am I trying to tell you here? <laughs> if you haven't really felt connected, again, the whole oxytocin thing is some of it is about connection. And so if you haven't really felt connected with your partner because you've just been so busy, maybe you actually kind of like the guy or the woman. <laughs> maybe you like your partner, you think but you've forgotten why, you know, or you just haven't spent enough time together. <laughs> you know, you can either decide to, to see if there's something there and to try and sort of build again sort of the flame that was there. Or quite frankly, I mean, the, the new partner works. I mean, people like novelty. You will become more libidinous with somebody new. Uh, that's the bottom line. Now, I'm not saying that there are not other reasons why women, as we age, start, I mean, we have hormonal changes, but quite frankly, replacing and giving a lot of testosterone seems to really only help women who, who were very, very hot, who were pretty libidinous earlier on in life. So they were, these were women who really liked sex very much and were very sexually active. And then when they went through the menopause, just notice a really abrupt sort of a decrease in, in sort of sexual interest. So that if you, you know, women whose sort of sexual interest has kind of always been, mm, you know, and then they go through the menopause and they're not happy with their sexual interest, it doesn't seem like androgens do a whole lot to at least promote that sort of sexual interest. And I think the most important thing to think about is that sex is very complex and that for women it's very psychological and that there are things that you can do other than just addressing your hormones. I'm not saying you shouldn't address your hormones, but there are other things to do. It's not a simple answer. It's multifactorial, okay? So stress changes the brain and how you feel, okay? That's the bottom line and that's nothing new to you. Time with friends and good sex can be protective <laughs> against stress, okay? <laughs> Bottom line. All right. Exercise is a must for brain health if you really, really want to know the truth. And libido is just, it's complicated. I am more than happy to talk to people further about libido, but it is complicated and it isn't just about hormone levels. It really is about how you're feeling about yourself physically, which exercise can certainly be positive for. How do you feel about your partner? And how you feel about your partner today and your body today doesn't have to be permanent. Just because you may be not particularly happy with things in your relationship at the present doesn't mean that that can't get better. So I'm not suggesting that you just give up on it and go for the new guy, but, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's what she showed worked, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> you could stay with the person you're with and work on it, and I, and I think that there's certainly benefits to doing that. But um, in any case, uh, it's complicated. <laughs>